Well, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to um, basically um, maybe veer off a little bit from the animal model theme. Um, I'll, I'll touch it on it briefly, um, but I really wanted to back up uh, to maybe 30,000 feet and give a more, you know, in this very, very short talk, um, just a broader overview of where I think we are. So we're in the midst of a genetics revolution. This is across many disorders. And what I wanna do is introduce the notion of precision health. Then I'll dive into autism. We'll discuss what genes have been identified and how we move from individual genes to biological understanding and treatment and just provide a kind of framework. Of course, uh, this is just a framework and a model that kind of continually is evolving as we make more discoveries. Um, let me also make another point is that, you know, um, because we study genetics does not mean that we are, uh, um, have blinders on to environmental issues and other things. In fact, every disorder uh, that humans have other than very, very, you know, the rare Mendelian uh, single gene disorders, but even those can be modified by environment. So, the you know, I talk about genetics because it provides a clear starting anchor for causality that's tractable and is proved in, in many other disorders outside of the brain, cancer, immune disorders, et cetera, to be extraordinary in terms of therapeutic development and has provided the clearest road in that direction. So we're kind of in a revolution of healthcare, just on the, on the cusp of it. Medicine today, we treat everybody kind of the same. Um, uh, you know, you come in, you get the top blood pressure medicine or diabetes drug or whatever your doctor prescribes, but uh, we know that there are tons of individual differences. Um, and uh, the notion of precision health is really predictive, preventive, patient-centric model of care, where one tries to get use as much individual information from a patient as possible to drive these things. And there are two major drivers of this of this, uh, you know, I'll call it um, um, movement. One is dramatically decreasing DNA sequencing costs, costs that alter approach to human disease at the same time as computer power increases. What's shown here in green is Moore's law. That is that integrated circuits will have twice the density every 18 months of transistors on them by Gordon Moore predicted this is, uh, you know, in the, I think it was in the 60s. And, and as, it, as it turns out, that's an exponential curve because it's a log scale. And if you look at the red, that's the cost of getting genetic information. And it's dropped precipitously since the mid 2000s, more, more rapid than this exponential because of changes in technology that have been transformative. Now we can do a whole exome sequencing, which is sequencing of your protein coding genes. We're on the order of about $250. The second piece of this is computer power increasing, and that's been transformational. Without both of these coupled, um, we really couldn't take advantage of the genomic information. The computational and bioinformatic changes have been essential to this. Another piece of this is also the ability to capture and to store and to analyze your other types of information, such as you know, you know, mobile health kind of information, exercise, diet, et cetera. And that feeds into this clearly as well. So as a result, millions of genomes have, have been sequenced and we now have the power to analyze them. So we're at the beginning of what will be an explosion of genetic discoveries across populations, more genomes being sequenced. And the more that are sequenced, believe it or not, the more we know about the community, the more we understand about the in individual because we can look at what sequences uh, separate certain individuals from another. It will allow us to identify new drug targets. It, it already has multiple prevention, diagnosis, prognosis, and optimizing treatment. And so it, of course, this has been most successful in cancer, but even in rare disorders, a, a variety from brain disorders to cardiac and immunologic disorders, it already has led to uh, vast changes in our treatment. So this 
is paralleled and led to a rapid growth in autism genetics. This is from a, a review by Thomas Bourgeau. Um, and, and, you know, and you can basically see that there's been this exponential rise in the last 15 years that corresponds with the accessibility of technology. And this is from a review that Brett Abrams and I wrote that um, in 2008, um, about uh, you know almost, you know eight years before this review that really talked about how things have been moving along in terms of the technology and you can see there it was microarrays whole exome sequencing whole genome and we were you know you know really showing how this is leading to a huge change in 2008 you can see we're at the cusp of that beginning with norexin and shanks and CNT and AP2 mutations but uh, you know subsequent to that there have been hundreds of genes identified. I'm sure Joe Buxbaum will talk more about that. I'm just gonna mention a few key facts here. One is that um, if we're looking here, we're looking at the rate of, uh, of, of uh, rare mutations. And these are a kind of mutation called de novo mutations. They're not inherited. They're like Down syndrome in terms of how they're actually. And what one can see is that kind of the larger um, of these, you, you know, if you look at patient outcomes on the bottom, that the more of either delayed walking, seizures, intellectual disability you have, in other words, if you have all of those three, the likelihood of you having one of those rare mutations is 15 odds. You have a 15 fold increase over somebody who has autism, but doesn't have them. So in other words, a lot of the mutations are pleiotropic. They cause um, kind of more broad um, effects than just what we see as autism. And the other point is that they also um, are, are part of a continuum of risk that can affect cognition in some people, can lead to increase in schizophrenia and other disorders, in other words, what we call in genetics pleiotropy, that is that these mutations aren't specific to autism. They have large effects on brain development and therefore can cause a lot of different syndromes. And so just to kind of show the difference between 2008, when we were at the beginning of that cusp, a handful of genes, little understanding of mechanism, major pharmaceutical companies withdrawing from CNS work and little interest in autism. By 2016, this is the citing a 2013 paper but even five or six years later, there were hundreds of candidate genes, clear mechanistic models, um, evidence for overlap and cross disorder overlap and major drug development efforts and on, in autism ongoing. And again, the point I wanna make is that um, there aren't necess these genes cause a, usually uh, they cause major medical genetic impact that doesn't just affect social cognition and repetitive behavior, but often leads to motor dysfunction and other associated um, um, uh, physical issues. And, uh, you know, in many cases, not in all. So the genetics has really transformed the landscape by beginning to give us a picture of the fact that about 20% of autism is a collection of rare disorders, ranging from fragile X to individual gene mutations none of which really account for more than 1%. It's very heterogeneous. And those are gonna account for about 10 or 20% of autism. Then there's common inherited variation. That is stuff that we all inherit that is going to be contributing and unaccounted for, we don't know. And so what this means is that still about 40% we don't have a handle on. A lot of this might be rare inherited variation and some of it is just um, you know, maybe gene-gene interactions, gene environment, and other things that are very difficult to measure at this point. So where we are is many genes are going to contribute to autism, maybe over a thousand, highly additive effects in many cases. So you might have common variation plus these rare mutations or a, or a lot of common variation. None account for about more than 1% of cases. Again, this notion of a collection of rare disorders and strong pleiotropy. Pleiotropy meaning that a mutation can cause autism, let's say in one individual, and it might lead to intellectual disability and, and epilepsy in another, or even a rare form of schizophrenia in a third. But the challenge is that these advances in genetics and genomics have proven their promise. 
They've identified many genes involved in susceptibility. These genes provide targets for mechanistic understanding and therapeutic development as you hear. However, they highlight extreme genetic heterogeneity. Will we have to develop a specific treatment for each disorder or will there be convergence in specific biological pathways, developmental stages or processes um, or brain circuitry? And, you know, and just to kind of show this really quickly in a kind of cartoon that I wrote now a decade ago, it's, it, it's just showing here is at the time some major mutations that were known uh, that cause um, um, developmental disorders that um, increase the risk for autism, duplication 15Q through Timothy syndrome at the bottom. And the question is, do these overlap um, at, certainly at brain regions and circuits because behavior emanates from certain brain regions. If I affect the visual part of your brain, I'm not gonna necessarily be affecting um, uh, um, parts that are involved in memory, if I affect memory, et cetera. That's why Alzheimer's disease looks the way it does and other, and Parkinson's looks the way it does. It has to do with the circuits that they're affecting. So one of the models that we put forward uh, a while ago is that this is really autism in part is a developmental disorder involving disconnection or malfunctioning of critical brain circuits. It doesn't mean that they're physically disconnected. They might be. It could also be because synapse transmission is altered or other or metabolism is altered that could affect timing leading to a, a disconnection that is, that is um, um, functional disconnection of the regions. So at some level, autism has to converge in various brain circuits involved in social cognition and repetitive restrictive behavior and in many cases language. But the question is from a therapeutic standpoint, is it converging in molecular pathways? Is it converging in biological processes such as abnormalities and patterning, et cetera? That is, is very unlikely, I'm just gonna state, because even single mutations like TSC or 22Q dupe or others affect multiple of these biological functions because they, again, can affect, they affect multiple stages of development. So, but there are questions about, you know, even if there isn't huge convergence on biological pathways, they still may be treatment targets, don't get me wrong. So questions that are now being asked have to do with the fact, is there convergence? Or can I, if I have 200 genes and 200 different patients, do I have to come up with 200 different therapies? Think about it like cancer, where now people are getting treatments based upon their mutations. And about six or 7% of patients with cancer now will get a sequencing done that gives them a specific targeted therapy. But prior to that, we used, let's say therapies that targeted processes like proliferation or invasion of tissues. And we try to block that broadly. And so there are many different places that we could potentially intervene. So we ask the question, when and where do autism genes act? Right? The first you know, question is if we identify them, are they affecting certain cells or they, you know, development, et cetera? And it, it's pretty clear now that there is convergence in prenatal development. Some are slightly postnatal, but almost all of the genes begin to be expressed at mid gestation during the period of neurogenesis, neuronal migration, and corticogenesis. And what we showed in this paper now almost 10 years ago is that two major processes at that time when only a handful of genes were really known for sure, and there were maybe a hundred or so that were ha had lower levels of evidence, that early transcriptional regulation, that is things that turn genes on and off, as well as synaptic development. And where these things crossed was kind of around mid gestation, around 16 to 20 weeks. And so again, we're seeing expression of these genes early during neurogenesis, early cortical development. When we asked what kinds of cells they affected, they affected a broad range. But if we asked, is there one that's affected more than others? It was the superficial neuronal projection cells, neurons that project 
between cortical regions and across the hemispheres. So things that connect the brain and connect. And as it turns out, um, that kind of fits with this notion of disconnection and, a, and a, almost two decades now of neuroimaging showing long range disconnection in autism. We've subsequently, and so have others, validated this in numerous studies. In fact, the new work validates this and expands it by identifying new genes and some additional pathways. Some work we did uh, recently showed um, also involvement of vesicle transport and micro, you know, and cytoskeletal microtubule processes. But these are again related to synaptic transmission, um, you know, in the end. So at one level, the you know genes seem to converge in certain processes. So uh, you know maybe there is some some possibility of intervening. One of the problems is you know when uh, we don't know that yet, and um, but there are studies in animal models, again in animal models with single gene mutations that show at least partial reversal of the abnormal behavioral or cognitive phenotypes in those like Rett syndrome or tuberous sclerosis by treating them in the adult. So we do have hope based on animal models that we may be able to, even though this is happening early, there might be some reversal later. We can also look at the brain. And one of the amazing things about, uh, you know, about psychiatric diseases and it's vexing in an amazing way is that unlike neurologic disorders, there isn't any obvious gross pathology. In other words, we don't see a particular region affected. We don't see a protein being deposited or cells dying. There's no even microscopic pathology. However, if we go submicroscopically, my lab and others now have demonstrated that there is that looking at what RNAs are expressed submicroscopically, we can actually identify patterns of disruption across numerous psychiatric diseases, including autism. And I'm just gonna show one recent paper here. We compared autism, schizophrenia and bipolar, and it was part of the PsychEncode collection that was uh, in 2018 in science. This is showing a very complex pattern there. And what we basically see is a number of cells being differentially um, at the top are uh, disease effects showing which of these, these, this is a network analysis of co-expressed modules. So it's showing grouping of genes that form basic biological processes. And we can see some are blue is down, red is up, you know, or more down in autism, schizophrenia, et cetera. That's the association. We can show an enrichment for genetic effects. And those would give you a causal anchor because the genetics is where the causation starts. Some of the other changes may be contributory or reactive, et cetera, because uh, somebody's had autism for a while and, we, and the brains are profiled after that. We can also look at various patterns of cell type enrichment. And so we see when we start to dig down into that below is that we see modules that are downregulated processes in very specific cell types in autism and not as much in bipolar or schizophrenia. We see some that are specific to schizophrenia and bipolar, et cetera. So this kind of work has allowed us to refine what are the specific molecular processes that are present in the brain of somebody with this condition and shared by more than two thirds of them, some of these shown below. And the question is then, um, can we target these? How do these connect in the individual to the specific genetic causes. So that's the work that really has to be done now, connecting these dots. But we do have these patterns, these transcriptome patterns of dysregulation that differentiate these various conditions from control neurotypical brain across the lifespan. We've also, because of the genetics, hit biological processes, again, Here's the mTOR pathway. There's the balance of excitation and inhibition, um, cortical columnar development, again, connectivity. Are these things that we can also target in certain patients? And specific molecular pathways, again, activity-dependent protein synthesis, neuronal activity, 
neuronal cell adhesion. So our job now is to put these kind of known pathways on top of and integrate them with the things that look like they're dysregulated in postmortem brain that I showed you on the previous slide. And that's an ongoing process. But once we have those pathways and patterns, how do we develop therapeutics? Now, a lot has been done in mouse and we've worked in mouse quite a bit, but um, some of the, but there's also issues with mouse and rats, um, which have to do with the fact that they're not small humans. Now, many circuits are well conserved and some aren't. They're also not that high throughput. And what I mean by that is that I cannot do screen 200,000 drugs in a mouse, but I can do that in a dish if I have the right cells. And now we can grow patient neurons from a skin fibroblast or from a blood cell and grow the glial cells as well and grow them in a dish. And the first paper to do this in an autism syndrome was led by Ricardo Dolmetsch and when Sergio Pasco was a postdoc in his lab, which we collaborated with them on doing all of the genomics work. And essentially they're able to show cellular phenotypes that could be reversed. The issue here is that every model system has its strengths and weaknesses. Mouse models are in vivo, so are non-human primates. But the throughput, the number of things we can test in them is lower. So there has to be a back and forth between in vitro models and in vivo, and the advent of stem cells has really pushed that forward, and the modeling has accelerated wonderfully. So the IPSC and primary human neural progenitors are kind of in this area where you can grow hundreds of thousands of wells of these and now use them for screening. I'm just gonna show again that we've shown, one of the issues is how well do these model in vivo human development? And I'm not gonna belabor this point, but just say that we have developed a number of genomic, highly quantitative frameworks for evaluating how well these model in vivo data because we have in vivo data now. And we've been able to use this with our collaborators to develop very functional models. In fact, most recently, Sergio Pasca's lab led a beautiful study where they um, showed um, very clear, and very specific deficits in a human cellular model of 22Q deletion syndrome. And just to summarize this very briefly, that using gene expression, we showed that there was a calcium signaling deficit and likely to be a change in resting membrane potentials and their response that was validated physiologically. And then Sergio's lab showed that you could rescue that with a common antipsychotic drug, raclopride. So again, this is a proof of principle that one can find phenotypes in vitro that are screenable and that respond to drugs in the way that you might expect humans to. One of the questions we've been asking though, if we back up a little bit, we have these networks of genes that are dysregulated in autism, schizophrenia and other disorders, these modules. And the question is, can we actually target these? Before we understand how the brain works, we do have these patterns. And it's possible that by reversing them, we could have a therapeutic effect. So there now are, ways of matching these transcriptional networks to find drugs. One of the earliest was the broad connectivity map, which is just one example. They have 7,000 expression profiles. So it's RNA. What happens to a cell after you give it a drug? And what we can basically do is ask, if we have gene expression in disease models or patient tissue, we can ask, can we find a pattern that's the reverse of this so we can reverse it? And then we identify as drugs that reverse the patterns and test them in model systems. And in neurodegeneration, we've done this in multiple papers, including a nature medicine paper last year. We showed very convincingly in my view at least, and in the reviewer's view, how one could use a transcriptome profile to identify a set of drugs and then use those and show that it blocks the phenotype that you're trying to reverse. The key in autism now is we have to define what those phenotypes are a little bit more rigorously. And I think we'll be ready for this kind of approach. So autism risk has a large genetic component, but it's etiologic, 
etiology is multifactorial. Genetic studies have been very successful. And I think we have been capitalizing on genetic findings using convergent evidence from studies in human brain and model systems to begin to elucidate the neural system's basis of autism. Autism risk genes converge to impact early fetal development and development of the cerebral cortex. And these genetic findings provide a starting point to create in vitro and in vivo models to identify potential convergent molecular pathways for development of therapies. So I have to acknowledge a large number of people. The blue are folks that are in my lab. Um, Neil Parikshak led gene expression studies along with Mike Gandel, Vivek and Grant Belgard. Jason Stein and Luis de la Torre developed the stem cell models and quantitative framework when they were postdocs in the lab. And Hei Jung Wan uh, contributes to all of that as well as some chromatin studies that I didn't have time to discuss. On the genetic side, we were collaborating with Dennis Wall and that was led by Laura Perez-Cano and Elizabeth Russo. Um, we, a lot of what we're doing now is involved in creating maps of brain gene expression with the Psych Encode project. And um, these kind of collaborative efforts are really essential. Thanks for your attention. And thank you, Dan, for, for a wonderful presentation. Um, maybe we, we have time for a couple of questions before our break in, in a few minutes. Um, so I'll start with, uh, this, this notion that, that you mentioned that A, it doesn't appear to be any structural damage that at least is consistently found in the autistic brain. I, you know, I think this to me is, is a good sign, right? Because you know, if you compare it to something like neurodegeneration or multiple sclerosis where you see lesions or actual cell death, that to me seems like a higher bar to, to overcome. But so getting to those regions that are then affected in the, the autistic brain. So your approach of looking at the molecular underpinnings that may change physiology or biology in that particular region, how can therapeutics do better for autism than we have for cancer, right? So as you mentioned, you know- Well, check it's actually, the, I mean- Yeah, yeah, yeah I would so, say so that- How do we not get those off-target effects that, that we well, would for-, for Let me people? flip that around a little bit. You know, cancer, it's not perfect, but there are drugs that even, you know, and radiation that 20, 30 years ago uh, worked in a lot of cancer. So it would be nice in autism to have the equivalent of those. Of course, you know, you don't want them to be toxic, of course, because you're, you know, but what I'm saying is that having these general, you know, it wasn't so, you know, it's not the optimal, but it's not bad. Um, but I think now about six or 7% of cancers in the last five or six years, we can now identify BRAF mutations and other things and have very specific, uh, targets for them. So I think cancer, again, is about a decade ahead of neuroscience. And um, that's how it's always been uh, since I started training in the 80s. And um, so I think we're moving in that direction where one will take individual mutations and find drugs that reverse those phenotypes and then see if um, how broad the effects are of those, of, you know, of those drugs, how many how many different uh, things might be affected. But again, there may be other commonalities and other ways to modulate things in the meantime, as we're moving in that direction. So, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that actually. Um, um, and I, yeah, so I, there were a couple of questions that I got on the, on the app that I could answer really quickly just so I get to them. So what causes high rate of de novo mutations? One thing is the father's age other things unknown, um, but there is, a, there is a kind of background rate of de novo mutations and a lot of it has to do with the fact that our, our mismatch repair processes are not perfect. And as we get older, just like when you sprain your ankle when you're uh, 14, it fixes itself faster than it does when you're uh, 60. So, um, but it has to do with DNA repair not being perfect. And that's uh, kind of similar in some ways to some cancer mechanisms. Um, so, Somebody asked a very good question. There's so many labs out there doing whole genome sequencing with widely disparate pricing. Not only highly disparate pricing, but highly disparate quality. Mm -hmm. I suggest that if you're gonna get sequencing done, you do it in an academic medical center where it's interpreted by experts and you actually get the, you know, the kind of state of the art interpretation. So like at UCLA for about eight or nine years, we've been doing exome sequencing and now we move on to whole genome where we have a whole data board that meets and goes over these things in a very academic and careful way. What we can, you know, uh, that's something that a commercial lab just can never do. And, you know, it doesn't do. Um, somebody asked about sex approaches. That's really essential. And 
um, in a much longer talk, I could talk about that. In fact, we've been able to use these patterns at the systems biology level to ask very pointed questions about where the sex effects are likely to occur. And what we find so far is that it's not the actual genetic risk that's sex differential. It's actually specific aspects of the neurons and glia in neurotypical development and in brain that differ between males and females with which the genetic risk is likely interacting. And that's a story for another day, but some of that's been published. And again, if you send me an email or something, I can refer you to some of that studies. Although I'd have to say it's in very early days and much more needs to be done.